Thanks everybody uh, for coming uh, tonight. Uh, proud to be uh, joined uh, by both uh, House and Senate leadership teams. Uh, I think this is something you all have seen since the beginning of session. I, uh, I know reflects a, a commitment on both the part of myself and uh, President Pro Tem Richard to make sure that the House and Senate are doing a better job of working together than we have in the past. Um, I think the highlight uh, from, from the governor's uh, budget tonight, the thing that ought to be talked about a lot over the coming days is the fact that uh, we've just received a request for a supplemental budget request that uh, is in excess of $400 million. Before we can begin any kind of discussion um, on what this budget's gonna look like going forward, we're gonna have to address uh, that question first. I know we have both budget chairs uh, here that can talk about that a little bit uh, more tonight. The other thing I'll point out is that the governor's speech tonight, while he made a great deal out of Medicaid expansion, he did nothing to talk about the skyrocketing cost of our Medicaid program. Medicaid enrollment is up uh, more than 15% over the last 18 months, um, and we've seen that spending up more than 26% uh, over the over the term of uh, the Governor Nixon's been in office. Until we can find a way to get that cost under control, um, calls for expanding Medicaid just shouldn't be taken seriously. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, President Pro Tem Richard for a few things, and then we'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, and then uh, we will... We believe the Senate has spoken loudly. We uh, worked on support reform last night. Uh, we're moving on the Speaker's Ethics Reform, and I'm going to have uh, Majority Leader uh, uh, Kehoe speak about that, because we're fast-tracking that as the request for the Speaker. Um, there's been some request on the uh, Senate to look possibly at some judiciary reform and tax reform, before that goes, and I don't know, it's just questions we're talking about. Um, I think the partnership between the House and Senate is strong. I think you can see us Doing things has been done in many, many years around here with Speaker Richardson and myself and all of our chairmen. Uh, we did on purpose send bills from both sides of the building to committees early, quick. We got the legislature to work the faster than it has in recent years. Uh, the chairmen are engaged. I think we're doing the right thing for Missourians to get the debate going on issues that are important to them. Uh, again, I agree with the governor and uh, Speaker Richardson. Our main goal, my main goal since I've been here uh, 14 years, job creation, economic development, Great opportunity for Missouri. With that, uh, Senator Keeley, you want to speak to uh, the ethics? Yeah, I would just echo what uh, Senator Richard and um, uh, Speaker Richardson has said, is that uh, ethics has moved through our committee. Uh, we've heard uh, Senator Anders' bill. We took in the House bills that uh, uh, Representative Barnes voted out of committee in the House heard on the floor. Uh, we are moving things forward. I would just add that um, the culture in this building and ethics reform starts way before the session ever comes in. It starts with the leadership, and I think you're seeing uh, leadership that's unprecedented in this building in uh, both Todd Richardson and Ron Richard, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's what's got the tone of the Senate and the House and our relationship and our uh, desire to move ethics reform, tort reform, some of these other bills uh, forward, and you'll see, uh, you'll see that action happen. Have to take any questions. Mr. Speaker, last week you told us that you were looking for the governor to spend more time on specific proposals and less <coughs> about looking back. Did he meet your expectation tonight? I think we heard more of a victory lap uh, tonight than we did uh, any kind of uh, real recipe for how we move the state forward. We'll look for the opportunities where we can work with the governor uh, in the days ahead, but uh, I think tonight's speech was certainly focused more on where we've been and where we are going. What did this, you think that the governor did not mention tonight that you would have liked to mention? Well, I don't think the governor spent hardly any time, uh, with the exception of uh, his, his annual mention of where the auto industry is, about talking about how we're going to move uh, Missouri's economy forward. Um, and despite the fact that unemployment is low, the fact remains that wages are stagnant in the state. The earning power of Missouri family is $5,000 less than it was at, at the turn of the century. Um, we're going to get serious about trying to help people who are struggling. We've got to find a way to increase wages and help lift people up out. The governor had no answer for that. Do you gentlemen have legislation that would do that? I think we've had it considered a number of proposals, and I think you're going to see more in the coming days. Um, but those, the, the fundamental starting point uh, for us in trying to get this economy moving is to create the right kind of environment to allow job creators to do what they do best, and that means having a favorable litigation environment, having a favorable favorable labor policy in this state and favorable tax policy, and you're going to see a big part of the session be focused in those areas. Governor, there's some talk about what, what you just said 
favor the businesses but doesn't favor the worker? How do you respond to that kind of a complaint? Well, I think as businesses, small businesses continue to grow and are able to invest more in their employees, and wages continue to grow for everyone. Um, the more jobs we have here, uh, the better the state will be. And if somebody wants to argue at that point, then um, they can have that argument. The governor left out an issue he's raised, I think, every other state of the state here in his ethics package of limits on campaign contributions. Did that, did that resonate with you at all? Well, I think the governor and I do share a common goal to try to move some ethics reform uh, legislation forward. Um, and I think we're going to do that this session. So I, I didn't take particularly anything away from his failure. Does, does, does it help that he took that off the table? I, I don't think it helps or hurts. The legislature is going to move forward on ethics reform. Uh, as Speaker Richard and I, as President Pro Tem Richard and I said from the beginning of the session. Do you think he took it off the table because he didn't mention it to me? To, to be honest with you, I don't know if it's off the table or on the form. I, so, <coughs> what, I do you, what did you think about his mental health uh, calls? Yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing that we see in his budget, it's astronomical spending growth. In fact, I think I'll have to go back and look. And keep in mind, the governor's had four months to develop his budget, and I think 15 minutes before he spoke is when I, as the budget chairman, or the probes chairman, actually got a copy of his a summary. But keep in mind, from what I see so far, this is the largest spending increase this governor has proposed. I think, first of all, some of the things that are interesting, for example, spending on mental health, which was your question, for example, the Missouri legislature put $70 million for new mental health programs in this year's budget to start January 1st. So we put $70 million in to start January 1st and go the last six months of the year. The governor won't release that money. Now the governor turns around and says, hey, I want to do what you did in this year's budget but wouldn't fund, but now I want to do it next year's budget and I'm calling on you to do it. I think you're not going to find a lot of opposition because that's something that we funded for this year that the governor won't put the money in. But I think what you are going to find opposition on is the astronomical growth in welfare spending. The governor just delivered to us a $496 million supplemental. That is the largest supplemental. That is the largest increase halfway through the fiscal year that I know in my seven years here and my time as appropriations chair I've ever seen. $307 million of that is general revenue. So that's real tax dollars of Missourians we have to lay on the table. $277 million of that goes to social services for welfare expansion. Because there are over 100,000 people more on Medicaid today than there were at this time last year. And that has a cost. I think the other thing, uh, particularly from an appropriations aspect in this budget, is the governor is proposing spending $1.6 billion more in 2017 than we spent through the appropriations process in 2016. Half of that $635 million is expansion on Medicaid. So the one thing we've done in the last year or two with the Strengthening Families Act, with statewide managed care, is we have tried to rein in welfare spending to do some of those things that, frankly, we probably agree with the governor on, like spending on mental health programs and on economic development. But we're going to continue to rein that in, and we're not going to have out-of-control welfare. Are you saying some of these people shouldn't be on Medicaid, or you have to find a better way to spend the dollars? I think it's both, and I think the one thing that we've done with the Strengthening Families Act and some others is find those people that really should not be being carried by Missouri taxpayers and getting them off the dole. Now, I think we can agree with the governor on some things, for example, on mental health programs and some of those other programs where there are Missourians in needs. I think we, I think we have agreement. But the legislature has worked very, very hard, both this year and the last two years, to find savings and welfare spending. We found that. The governor on his way out the door isn't going to blow all that by increasing spending in Missouri by $1.6 billion predominantly on welfare growth in one year. Can you identify any particular group of people who you think ought to get off the dole? Yeah, I, look, I think that what we've done is refine eligibility standards and find ways to get people off that should have been off. We've cut back on a lot of it. The other thing is it's, it is unsustainable. I mean, $635 million growth in welfare spending just from this year to next year as proposed by the governor, that's real money that Missourians have to pay that could go to roads, it could go to public education, it could go to higher education, it could go to mental health programs, but instead we'll simply go to Medicaid. Well, a significant portion of, of that increase is due to provider rate increases that you all approved last year. It's due to pharmacy costs that- Because we're required to do that by the federal government. Under, fe under federal, the federal Medicaid law, yeah. whether you expand Medicaid. There's, there's no Medicaid doubt about that, that that large percent of the, of the growth that we see is because of Obamacare kicking people out and making them go into Medicaid. 
These are working families that would rather have their own insurance, paid for their own insurance. I met with a woman last week down in southern Missouri who said that she had her own insurance that she paid for. She liked her plan. When she got onto the exchange, it kicked her off. It kicked her and her family into Medicaid. She did not want to go. She actually was one of the rare people that was successful in finding an insurance agent and being able to get around it and get on her own insurance. But that's what happened. The federal law kicked a lot of people over onto Medicaid who were on their own private insurance before. So how many people are on Medicaid who are working when families can't earn more than, say, $4,000 a year and receive Medicaid in Missouri? Well, what we know is there was just under 900,000 people on Medicaid last year. There's now just under a million. That's one-fifth of Missouri's population now having their health care paid for by other Missourians. It's a trend that's unsustainable. Does that include the CHIPS program? No. Remember, CHIPS didn't count for that because CHIPS covers kids up to 300% of the poverty level. So the, so the federal government expansion did not affect them. We were already covering children in the state of Missouri at a higher level to begin with. Can we take your uh, response, Senator, meaning that uh, Medicaid expansion that the governor called for again is in Well, I will tell you, had we done Medicaid expansion, there would have been $250 million at a bare minimum of general revenue added onto this budget that would have come from public education, would have come from roads, would have come from economic development. And what we know is by the year 2022, 2023, when that number approached a billion, it was absolutely unsustainable. So even though we're seeing the growth that the governor is proposing on Medicaid spending, had we done expansion, we'd be in a much worse situation. And I think the one thing the governor did not mention is those states that did do expansion are experiencing terrible financial situations. So Arkansas, advice. who tried to do their own program, is now going to require a bailout. Illinois is now substantially in debt because of their expansion, while well, in many other things. So what are the odds for Medicaid expansion in this legislature? I would say as long as I'm the appropriations chair and I think we have agreement among the leadership, it's not going to happen. Is there anything else that the governor uh, talked about tonight you feel like is completely, absolutely off the table for the session in your opinion? Well, I think, you know, and again, we've only had the budget now for 15 minutes before the governor started giving his address. But I think when you look at a $400 uh, and, and, and you know, $96 million, $95 million supplemental, with $1.6 billion increase on top of that between spending from 2016 and 2017, that's not sustainable. And I think what you're going to find is now we will do the heavy lifting in the House and in the Senate of boiling it down and finding out what is sustainable and what are good programs. But I think on things like mental health and some of the other programs, you're probably not going to find disagreement. <coughs> but I think on some of those things where the governor is proposing unsustainable welfare growth, uh, I don't think it's going to happen. So do you, you agree or disagree on the governor's call to regulate uh, daily fantasy sports sites? That just seemed to come out of. Um, That's the most I've heard about. I mean, the speaker and I had to visit that, but uh, I suspect we visit all the time. I'm sure it'll be talking and talking. Senator Richard, you've been in leadership for most of the period of time that the governor has been um, in office, and um, you. So you were, remember when we had the unemployment rate of 10 percent? He mentioned, and now we're at 4.4 percent. Speaker Richardson said the speech sounded like a victory lap. Does the governor deserve a victory lap at this point? Well, he's been there eight years. I mean, that's some sort of victory. I think um, he's <laughs> taking credit for the business cycle. Um, I, you know, you got to give the guy credit. He is a governor, and, and the speaker and I do give him the respect. Uh, we, we respect the fact that he wants to protect that AAA bond rating. I think that's important. Um, I do believe that uh, you know he's working towards a legacy of what, and I think that's proper. But you know, our budget chairman of the House and Senate are are very respected in our caucuses, and that's going to be our priority, and this is kind of a shocker, the amount of money that's supplemental, and I think, uh, I won't speak to the speaker, but I think my budget chairman is exactly right. We've got to address that before we get to the budget and see where we're at. The new budget includes a 2% pay raise for state employees. Also for statewide elected officials, but it wouldn't apply to legislators until after the next elected cycle, as I understand. So what that would mean, I guess, is in 27, the statewide electeds would get a 2% increase, the legislators would not until after the next election. Are you generally okay with that, or is what you just said make that uh, a, a cause for concern? Well, I think when you look at what we, we did a couple of years ago, well, frankly, the governor didn't agree with it, where we gave a pay raise to state workers. The governor was not in support of it, and we did it anyway. I think what we've shown in the General Assembly is we are supportive of making sure it's <coughs> fair for state workers. Uh, I think when you start getting higher up the food chain and you start looking at statewide electeds giving themselves a two percent increase, I'd say that there's probably going to be a, a very strong look at that. How can public elected officials receive a pay raise when the state salary when the salary commission 
I think it's a very uh, good question. Has, um, I just found this out 15 minutes before he started speaking. So there are a lot of implications to so that that we'll have to look at. The legislature can vote its own pay raise if you all wish to in sure. this budget? No, that's this budget, but we can, uh, that's what next year is, they have two years. Get a, I mean, from time to time, we get a, from that commission sends something to us, we either vote yes or no. And we chose to vote. Look, we, we call on the Chairman Flanagan and I call on the governor to include a pay raise for state employees in, in his budget. Uh, I'm happy to see that he heeded that call and, and put something in. Um, obviously, we don't think uh, elected officials ought to be being paid more when we can't pay the state workers. That's why we took the action we took last year to reject uh, our own pay increase. Uh, but to the extent that we can find some ways to pay our state workers more, um, I know that's going to be a priority for the budget chairman. Does NANA have any chance of passing? No. Not in the Senate. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.